Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Therapist Uncensored. This is a podcast that breaks down interpersonal science into practical and understandable tidbits. And as you listen, I can just imagine little light bulbs of insight appearing above your head. Absolutely. You're going to be surprised and touched at what you learn about yourself as you get more accurate and in-depth view of your mind and your heart and as you figure out those close to you. Therapist Uncensored brings you decades of experience with interpersonal psychotherapy, relational neuroscience, modern attachment, and anything else they think will be helpful in healing humans. Now, here are your co-hosts, Dr. Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. So today we are going to do a deep dive into one of the building blocks that moves us towards secure relations and relationships and including with ourself. And Anne has been particularly interested in, and I would say, could I say a little obsessed about this concept of curiosity? So let's start with, why don't you tell us why this is so, why you're so curious about curiosity? <laughs> I guess you could say I've been a little obsessed. I've gotten my like beyond one thing. I think because if I can imagine giving one quality of mind to anybody that walked into my office door or any of my friends, the aspect that I would want to will to people is increased curiosity. I feel like it's an elixir for, <laughs> I, I do, it sounds funny, but it's like, if you think about it, curiosity is what can engage us in the most alert aspects of our own body and a deepest connection with the other people in our lives if we actually find that state. But it's not as easy as it seems, is it? Not at all. I actually, I'm, I'm remembering how that I was much more able, it was much closer to me, this quality of being curious when I had little ones, because they would be so curious, you know? And yeah. I, I remember pushing a stroller with my oldest and I was looking at the shadows that we were making and I was like playing with the shadows as I'm pushing. And I don't think I would have done that except having sat with him and watching him discover everything is new. And so I just remember it being really fascinating of like, think about what a shadow is. That's the coolest thing. And it was silly in a way, but it's like, oh, I saw a shadow in a new way. Oh, yeah, especially if you see things through a child's gaze. Yes. Why do we lose it as we age? That actually is true. We do lose curiosity as we age. If we think about it, though, when we're born, we're born needing all this novel information and having all this, and we have to make sense of it. And we have to put a place and a name to everything. So we have so much hunger in our mind to take in all this new stimuli. And as you think about it, as you get older... You know, you quit feeling like you're having new experiences. You feel like things are predictable. And we can't, I guess, go through the world with a childlike wonder with all the stimulation and taxes. and. Well, but I think that's the challenge that you're posing is, well, of course, we know things. We already have this experience with things. But sometimes that's a real problem because we just shut down. Like, it really is a state that you can enter to where you discover something, even something very familiar, new again, if we cultivate this, right? Absolutely. And it is an experience of cultivating it. And some of you guys out there may be thinking, I'm curious all the time. I have this, my phone, and every time I'm curious. I'm Googling all the time. I'm watching YouTube about how to do new things. <laughs> Absolutely. And it just feels like yeah, I could go down the rabbit hole of new information. And you think, see, I'm curious all the time. And that is an aspect of curiosity. It's a curiosity for knowledge. But I ask you to think out there when you do it, how often are you doing it because you actually feel, really feel the sense of curiosity rather than a little bit of boredom or a need for entertainment or a distraction? Because that's very different than having a thirst for knowledge than it is a desire to be distracted, right? Oh, entirely. And yeah, I like your point about curiosity about things mm -hmm. versus where I think you're going is being curious about the other and even ourselves. Like sometimes I just feel like I know things, <laughs> believe it or not. I know that's going to be hard to believe, but, <laughs> but moving out of that certainty into this uncertainty, certainty can be in our lower brain, right? Moving into this place, the prefrontal cortex and the orbifrontal cortex, we can let ourselves not know. It's almost like you have to be secure enough to let yourself not be certain. 
Does that sound right to you? Spot on, actually, because it does take a lot of security to be uncertain. That just made me so happy. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It takes a lot of security to be able to get into this place that says, I don't know everything. And as a matter of fact, thinking you know everything is actually a sign of insecurity. It's not actually a sign of knowledge, which is really interesting because we know, we've talked about this in other podcasts, that the more connected we are to our phones, the more we start forgetting that the knowledge of the phone is not actually in our brain. We think we're as smart as our phone is. And so in some ways, we don't want to lose the art of uncertainty and curiosity. It's interesting if you think about how curiosity has been studied in the brain. It might be interesting to know that if you activate true curiosity in somebody, your brain reads very similarly to our desire for food and rewards. It's a big reward system when you can actually activate it. Oh, you know, I can kind of see that. Like, And again, as you're listening, just kind of see if you can kind of go internal and like what does it actually feel like in your body, in your individual body, to feel that feeling of curiosity. And I wouldn't have thought of that, but I think you're right because there's some, there's an anticipation. Yes. There's an excitement. There's a approach feeling, a moving towards something. It's pleasure. It's, it's associated with pleasure. Completely. It activates the, the midbrain area that is the center for wanting. It's the center, if you imagine a dessert coming towards you that you've ordered and you'll see the waiter coming to you and all of a sudden you get this little bit of an excitement. That's the midbrain going off, and it that it activates that part. Then it also activates the hippocampus, and that's an exciting part too, because it's related to memory, and in particular, like new working memory. So we're activating wanting and the parts of us that wants to learn. And so if you activate both of those, that's a pretty rewarding center to hit. This is how it moves us towards more secure relationships, is that it allows us to update a model. So maybe I think... For example, if I'm looking at my child, it's like I'm supposed to teach him something. But with what you're talking about, Ian, if I can move more towards like, I want to discover something about him, you know, it's a more receptive position. And what that does is it allows me to be open to updating my model of this human being in front of me, rather than thinking I know them already. Exactly. That's a great way to put it. When I can really activate that and be genuinely, truly curious time slows down a little bit. Oh, yes. You know, so the, that silly example of the shadows, it's like I can be really immersed in it. And time slowing down is a good thing because it's part of presence and being present. That's just something that I've noticed is this notion of slowing down time. Well, yeah. And it really does, in order to actually experience the wanting, you have to be in the present moment. Because if you're not, you're going to disconnect from that part of your center that's so aware and alive. So maybe it would be a good like flag or something. If you can check yourself to see if you're there, then you you know, that's one of the green flags of like, good, go, you know, uh, you're on the right track about truly being curious, including even our own feelings. Well, absolutely. And I think one of the things I want to talk about, I think we should mention is that when we talk about something like curiosity, it sounds like it'd be so easy. So just go out there, go forth and be curious and we'll all be good. But it truthfully, let's talk a little bit about what makes it really hard because it can be a hard endeavor to stay in because as we approach uncertainty, some of us are more comfortable than that than others for various reasons I think we should talk about and at different times in our lives or different times, different topics, remaining in a place of uncertainty is easy and sometimes it's really not. Like I think about myself, if I'm sitting around and all of a sudden I'm with my family and we start getting into political discussions and I know that this family member very much differs on my political views. Then but but and what if you know you're right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, I think that's that shutting down of curiosity, right? <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> that's exactly what happens. I just feel like Ugh. I can just feel my whole body stiffen and I just Ugh, and I can already. And what I'm doing is I'm waiting for a break so I can say my point. I'm not curious in that perspective. I'm curious. Oh, yeah. Now we're loading our armor and. <laughs> Absolutely. Getting our ammunition. And <laughs> so you're not open. Yes, exactly. So to actually find a place of curiosity in that, it takes work and you have to be willing to embrace the uncertainty. And part of that, it does get a little more technical because 
you know, I was joking about, but I'm right. You know, what about when I'm right? But there really is a way that we can still hold what we know. It's not like you have to really not know something. Right. So I can hold what I know and believe deeply, but also be curious about, for example, what's motivating the other person or when they're so different from me, like that becomes fascinating. And it's like, how did they come to this point where that this is their beliefs or, or help me understand your view of the world so that I can get it a little bit more so I can both hold my own identity firmly, but also be open and curious and inviting of trying to understand something more deeply that is very different from me. Absolutely. And you have to be able to, though, to do that, to be able to slow down and actually feel yourself and then feel the other person because understandably different things that we might be coming to could create a sense of threat in us and we might even realize it. And as a matter of fact, I mean, if you think about, I know we do a lot of discussion about attachment. And so we're going to have to bring that into this dialogue because it's actually really relevant how we end up processing information and being able to take in a state of curiosity relates to how much security we can feel. And actually different attachment styles and working models approach it differently because someone that has been raised in a way to not feel safe in their environment and maybe more from a dismissing state of mind or a dismissing working model. Uh, For those of you that are familiar with the podcast, those would be on the blue side. Individuals when they were young over there, the idea of exploring was not filled with joy because as they would try to explore, they didn't actually feel the sense of trust that the attachment, the person that they were the most attachment attached to was going to be there. So because of that, their ability to be curious and experience joy wasn't there. And instead, they have a higher sense of insecurity. In other words, so somebody that has a more dismissing attachment style of relating, the feelings of being unknown or in the unknown state can create a lot of anxiety. Well, you know what it makes me think of, because you said two things that were really interesting to me. One was the lack of pleasure in exploring, particularly like I think of a child exploring a mother's face and their eyes and their ears and touching. And one of the things we know about folks that lean on the blue side that can tend towards more of a dismissing state of mind is that they have been pushed away. And if you think about it, like if they are playing happily with toys, then that's really encouraged. So I think on the blue side, you might be curious about information. (laughs) You might be curious about getting your new computer, but it directs you away from people and that there's not an active curiosity about oneself. And as a matter of fact, when folks are trying to get that or trying to tell you something about themselves to you, trying to update your model of how you see them, they find it intrusive. It's not pleasurable. It is more intrusive versus pleasurable. And again, this isn't for everybody, people that are blue, but. But yeah, they, they could experience an intrusive to them. And so what can happen is, is they may then associate that with people that are in their lives and that people they love, if to find curiosity and ask a lot of questions could feel they would project intrusiveness into their experience. Oh, that is so true in my groups and stuff like that. You know, I will ask the group, why, why aren't people out? You know, and they're like, well, if they wanted to tell us, they would tell us. You know? It's like, no. And so those of you who have that belief that you're going to hang back and wait for somebody to talk when they're ready. We want to update that a little bit. Yeah. And it's an understandable belief based on your young experience and your life experience. It's an understandable belief. But one of the things that you had learned as a very young child is self-reliance and being able to fill your own needs and to feel that relationship as a little bit overwhelming. And so you kind of get a reliance on a little bit more black and white thinking, kind of right, wrong. Yeah. And when I'm in that state, it's like, I'm going to tell you how things are, but probably not ask so much. I might teach someone something, but not necessarily be open to learning. Definitely. Like learning from their experience. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's when I was describing my political stance. I think when any of us feel a heightened threat to something, we're going to sway to one side or the other. And that one I get, well, I think I'm right. I think you're wrong. And I think a lot of us can fall into that in that high threat situations. And then some of us live there a lot more deeply if we tend to actually lean in that kind of a working model all the time and the feelings of vulnerability. So I think since we're talking about the blue, let's keep talking about the blue and what makes curiosity difficult. The other idea is that 
the idea of being uncertain and unknown creates a sense of distress in any of us. And from somebody that's been raised in a more secure working model, they feel like they can handle distress. So when new information comes at us and it doesn't fit with ours, it actually kind of creates chaos in our system. And if we feel like we can handle that chaos, then we can allow that curiosity and that feeling of uncertainty and the desire to get information that may change the way we think. Because changing the way we think is not an easy thing to do. And if you're in a more secure state, you're more open to doing that. When we're leaning to the blue, we're not very open to having our position shifted, primarily also because we don't want the distress. We're very motivated to cut off the distress in the emotional part and go very cognitive. So it's a relieving place to go right, wrong, yes, no. And then I don't have any distress because like we were talking about, I'm right. There's no distress in there. Yeah, I even think about shame related to this. Mm -hmm. And part of the things that come with curiosity is yearning, longing, desire. And those are the exact things that if you have grown up and you tend to lean a little blue, that that have been highly discouraged. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, you can almost imagine, you know, a child reaching out towards something and then being pushed away or being personally rejected or being told no. And then that shame feeling so then they pull back in and then they, they learn, we learn, those of us, all of us, that some of us have had that experience, not to explore, not to be curious. Basically, it's like, I'm not going to be caught longing again. So, And it happens so early, I don't even know that I'm cutting off my curiosity or my openness of my mind or my desire to be close to people. Right. And to experience that desire and have it not met feels so bad. So I'm just not even going to let myself experience it's the hope disappointment. So we'll just cut out that hope part and we'll be just fine. <laughs> and then we feel just fine because we're not actually connected to it. And in fact, research on curiosity with people that are living more in the blue, when they get more curiosity or they seek out the information is when it enhances their ability to avoid social interactions. So in other words, they would be more likely to work or to do information searches, et cetera, if it allows them to disconnect from social connections. They're, they're more motivated. Right. So here's another social example of that. And this actually came from a listener. I thought it was a great point because she said sometimes that we talk about it and it makes uh, blue people sound like cold fish. <laughs> and Oh, that's so not true. And yeah. it's so not true. However, one of the strategies is that they ask a lot of questions of people. So that can look curious, but if it's a strategy to hide <laughs> and in a way to avoid, to sort of look normal. <laughs> well, and avoid your own emotional vulnerability. Right, exactly. If it's a strategy to hide, that's different versus if you're genuinely genuinely, truly interested in learning about the person from a non-defensive place, that's where we're trying to nurture because this is changeable, right, Anne? This exactly. is changeable. It's the whole motivation for wanting my little obsession in this. This is so changeable and it, it does, it's not overnight. You gotta but practice it. Yeah. One of the ways our neural networks formed at a very young age is all these things we're talking about it. But as you open up yourself to go, okay, I can do this. I can ask questions and what we'll, I want to go over, but I'm going to save that maybe some different types of strategies to help us move out of that. But to know that it is changeable and that even if you just start with your child or your partner or your sister, start with one person and starting to build and allow yourself to feel that anxiety that comes by asking questions and making yourself do it anything as a habit done over and over again, it starts to build neural pathways that makes it easier and easier. And the anxiety that we're talking about starts to go down. Like you think of someone in your life, maybe that's very familiar to you and try on like, what do you not know about them? What have you not talked about in a really long time and perhaps that their views have changed or if for just one minute you could pretend that you didn't know them and you could see them with new fresh eyes, like a child's eyes, Again, it becomes really fascinating. And I bet that when approaching it this way, you actually will learn something new about that person, even though they're so familiar to you, like the back of your hand. Oh, and it's so... By the way, the back of your hand changes too, <laughs> I've noticed, <laughs> as, as we age a little bit. <laughs> Let's not remind ourselves of that. <laughs> but what about, you've said stuff about the blue side, which is, again, that's more of the dismissing avoidance state of mind. But what about on the other side, just real quickly, before we get to the how-tos? 
the interesting thing, the preoccupied or the more anxious side, red side, they do experience a lot of curiosity. So that the experience of curiosity is there, partly because we are, when we're in that place, we have a desire for the attachment. So we have more curiosity. Yeah, like what time are you going to be home? (laughs) (laughs) For the other person. Where are you? Why didn't you text me? Right. Are you curious or is it come? So how you know the difference in these questions is if you're feeling anxiety in your body related to the questions, you're probably not in curiosity. That's right. The questions actually are kind of more statements of like, um, I I need reassurance and I need you to help me feel better. (laughs) Were you delaying because you didn't want to be with me? So in other words, it's a way of putting a little fire hose on my anxiety. If you can tell me more and give me more information and reassure me, that's where the insecurity comes in that you were talking about. That's not a secure place. Right. Versus even if you kind of lean on that preoccupied side where we get a little nervous and anxious, that if we can move again to a place of not knowing, we don't know that they were delaying coming home because that they didn't want to be near me. We just have a part of us that thinks that. So instead, if we could really move into this place of uncertainty where that we can begin to wonder, like, oh, it could have been this and it could have been that and it could have been the other. Uncertainty and openness. So because you can have uncertainty and go, I'm not sure and ask a lot of questions, but it's uncertainty and openness right. about what the response is. Well, and another interesting thing is that if we're in the preoccupied, more anxious side, and we can cultivate that true curiosity and do, what also can happen is that then people tend to report that they start getting anxious, that it actually is going to promote rejection in the other person. So there's an insecurity that their own curiosity will be well-received. That's right. But if we practice this enough, if you think about it, somebody who's curious about you, truly curious and wanting to know you is very attractive. Oh, yes. <laughs> and part of why is because it feels safe, that it's a lot safer to have someone to feel like someone's genuinely interested in you than for us to be trying to explain ourselves and tell and like kind of force someone understanding us by us just talking about ourselves and trying to uh, be understood instead of that seeking where someone really genuinely wants to know and wants to understand. Yeah, and has a sense of security that they want that. That's exactly right. And so by developing that muscle of moving from certainty to uncertainty and uh, being interested in the other, the, uh, the other's authentic, true experience, that automatically, if you can think of the spectrum, it automatically moves you towards green from either side that you're coming from. Yeah. And that's the whole goal, right? That's what we're talking about is if we can, we started off this, if you could give one aspect of something that could really build a sense of security. And I said, for me, it would be curiosity because as we talk about both of these to be curious and to really find your own state of it, it's promoting again, the parts in your brain that activate interest and attachment. And then it brings you towards somebody and it encourages an approach feeling and a receptive feeling, which then builds that relationship. And the person, again, we talk a lot about neuroception between two people. When you show interest and you really are curious, that other person feels that level of curiosity and it calms their system down. And then they open up to their own vulnerability and you learn all sorts of deep things about them. Oh, I think that's a really good point. And it's kind of a right brain to right brain communication Mm -hmm. more than like a social left brain. You know, I can tell the difference between a social smile and a real smile. Well, we can tell the difference when somebody's really interested in us and they're not. And it really, it's a different quality. So what we're talking about is you being that person that gives the other person that feeling of genuine interest. And it will light up that autobiographical, that like I am being seen. And it will in you too, as they like, just like what you're saying, Anne, is that they will get more vulnerable and then the contact can be deeper and more sustained. And then you're giving that feeling of being seen to the other person, which activates all sorts of reward centers in their brain. And as a matter of fact, for those of you thinking about like, you're going to a party and you're thinking, I got to have something interesting to talk about. And there's like, I have three things interesting to talk about. Actually, what makes individuals the most likable out there in research, it's being interested, not being interesting. So the idea of cultivating curiosity affects us in so many different ways. And again, to remember that we can cultivate it even in ourselves as we grow older, even though curiosity could naturally go down, there's lots of ways to keep it going. 
we're going to get moved to the more practical, like what do we do about this? But I was actually even just thinking about how many clients can't let themselves be curious about me. Mm -hmm. So if you are in therapy, you get to be curious about your therapist. It doesn't mean that they're going to necessarily answer your questions or tell you about themselves. It, you know, you're both there for you, but it really moves the relationship into a much more interpersonal space when you can notice things about them. You know, they shouldn't be the only one that gets a comment on you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like if you notice something about them, you get to comment on them too. You get to analyze them even. You get to guess. And yeah, you might not get answers, but the curiosity says quite a bit. Right. And to- a lot of times I can just hear people saying, well, if you're not going to answer, why should I even wonder? And what I want you to hear in that is that it's that hope disappointment. You don't want to be disappointed. So part of that in group, it's like one of the number one things is to try to cultivate curiosity, being curious about your therapist, being curious about your own feelings rather than knowing, well, I'm anxious because of this, duh. (laughs) It's more of like, okay, well, that's a too familiar of a story. Can we deepen it or add to it or find some nuance that's new to it? Then it's fascinating. Oh, that's a really, really good point. So what are things that people can do? Let's remember we can train our brain. First thing that you can do is to really get more awareness of your own body because as we've talked about it, there's subtle feelings of threat that we don't even recognize. And we've talked about ways we just shut it off by being righteous or being known. So or we're teaching. <laughs> so notice the signs in your body of threat. And one of the ways you're going to notice it, do you have a lot of judgmental thoughts? Are you sitting with somebody and instead of actually listening, you're judging them? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Are you asking me? Oh, no, no. You're asking everybody else. Okay. <laughs> no, but the truth is actually we're judging each other all the time, right? But again, if you can begin to like have that observing self that's noticing yourself judging and maybe right. you're judging positively, maybe you're putting yourself down and they're awesome, or maybe you're judging negatively, but being able to see yourself doing that, that's where it gets interesting. It's a kind of form of cognitive closure. It's like a form of we're judging something. We're judging it because we want things. I guess I'm primarily thinking of it being more negative judgment yes. instead of positive judgment. Yes. But Austin, judgment is coming from that we have a set of knowledge that we have that we want to stick to and we don't want it shifted. Mm -hmm. And so there's a tendency to close that down. And so if you notice that judgment often is paired with a sense of distancing. Yes. So if you notice judgment, that's one of the things to do it. So one of the things to do is to stimulate your own curiosity. So let's just say you're having a conflict with your boyfriend or girlfriend and you're angry and you have judgments. And one of the reasons we actually were left out is that one of the reasons curiosity shuts down is that when we're with, especially in a long-term relationship, any in a partnership or anybody that we've known for a long time, is that we've had all these experiences with them. We're ready to predict what they're going to do. We, we don't even have to wonder because we have all these predictions. Oh, I know what he's going to say. I know what she's going to say. Right. The brain is an anticipation machine. Absolutely. Yeah. So with that, we tend to have less curiosity and we're already jumping. So one of the things to do is when you notice that judgment slow down and then stimulate your own curiosity. And one of the ways you could do that is why would he do this? Why would he say that? What might be going on inside of him that would generate that thing? Rather than, I know what he's going to do. I know what he's going to say. You ask your own stimulating questions that would generate curiosity and move you away from judgment. Does that make sense? Yeah. The way that I'm thinking of it is it's like when I let's say I'm upset about something, how I can move to a place of uncertainty or, you know, move out of that a little bit is if I think about, okay, if somebody else just experienced what I experienced, would they feel it as strongly as I do? Mm. And that is to me, it's like a, you know, as you get aroused, you begin to lose your thinking, but it's a little bit of a handhold of, if I can imagine other people having different responses, then my response moves me out of certainty. Yes. And more into an exploratory place. Right. So you're having uncertainty about yourself. That's like, right. You know, so stimulating your own curiosity, why would I be reacting this way? And why might they be reacting to me in this way? Exactly. No, I love that. All right. Another idea is also we've talked a lot about having to tolerate the uncertainty in your body. So again, as you're starting to listen, if you start to feel anxiety, notice it. And in fact, if you jump in to one of the things that we're talking about judgment. Another one that we tend to jump into is teaching. So we've walked out of a movie and we start immediately teaching. 
what the movie was about. What the movie's about. <laughs> <laughs> or we start teaching if our spouse is doing something, we start telling them how they really could be doing it. If you're in that mode, likely you are in a closed mindset and you're not really realizing what's going on inside your own body. Right. And then that's not bad. As you begin to notice these things that Anne's talking about, it's not bad that you're there. It's just simply we're, we're practicing a mindfulness exercise in a way by noticing it and then seeing if we can just gently, without any judgment, move ourselves back to this more open space. And that made me wonder about like, so curiosity itself is not a feeling. But and I think what you're moving at when you move us more into our bodies, right? Because curiosity to me is a little bit of a mental state. It's a mind body state. It's a mind body state. Because I agree. It takes the awareness into it, your own awareness of self, then the own awareness of the other. And it requires both. It requires both. That was where I was going was that it sounds kind of cognitive, right? but that what you're sort of challenging us all to do is to go more bottom up. It's almost like you got to wiggle your butt to find it, mm -hmm. you know, and like get comfortable where you actually can feel this opening. It's almost like your heart opens up a little bit. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. That's what I was kind of feeling as, as we're talking about it, about like, how do we bring the body language back and then bring it together with this concept, which you're saying exactly right. It's embodied. It's embodied. So yeah, I love that kind of coming from your own body. And, and let me go back to the teaching example related to what you're talking about. And that is, you may have something really important to give this person, but if you do, so you can feel your own desire to give, but if you stop and then you're curious about the other person, you have to stop and ask yourself, are they asking for that? Are they wanting that? And literally, by even asking the question, I have some great ideas, would you like it? Would you want to hear it? All of a sudden now you've made a connection that maybe your wisdom is wanted, or you might learn, no, I really just want to tell you about my experience. And just asking that question is more of a connecting. Oh, that's a great one. I love it. Because you've got to have an open door to enter. And so you have to be curious about the other person mm -hmm. before you can get there. That's right. Yeah. What else? Well, you said the other one a little bit earlier, and that is looking for novelty and in noticing changes in yourself and your hand and the other person. And I think about, I think about relationships, couples, you know, we have a lot of novelty in the very beginning. So you have all this excitement and we've talked about the wanting system yeah, and discovery, discovery, everything, even if it's a new friendship, there's a lot of discovery surprise and, and you have excitement about the curious of person and person being curious in you. And of course, the longer you're in a relationship with anybody, the less curiosity you might hold and you don't stimulate. In fact, relationships, early relationships break up for all sorts of reasons, but long-term relationships, the most predictable reason is not conflict. It's not financial instability. Guess what it is? Are you curious? <laughs> I'm super curious. It's boredom. Oh, that makes total sense. We break up out of boredom because the search for novelty and stimulation is so important to us. It's up there with sex and food. We actually need stimulation. And when in a relationship and you don't find it together and our bodies go flat, we get bored and we seek novelty elsewhere. And so I can't stress enough. And that's one thing I love about couples therapy is you get to learn to see your partner in this new novel way, but you don't need couples therapy for that. You just need to go home and when you're in the kitchen talking, really find curiosity. Don't wait for them to tell you, ask. That's right. And I'm even thinking again about like a child exploring a mother's face or something, like even seeing them, like seeing their eyes, their eyes have changed probably, especially if you've been together for a long time or their face, you know what I mean? Like yeah. re-exploring, rediscovering them. Yeah, I love that. Or asking when you're asking about their day, do you actually know who they work with and how they feel about them? Right. Versus the social question. How was your day? Fine. How was your day? You know, that's one thing. That's not curiosity, obviously. But cultivating that and it could be you might even be imagining it right now. And if you fall in the blue end, you might actually find yourself feeling a little anxious about doing that. And what I would encourage you to do is to let yourself be a little anxious and let yourself tolerate <laughs> <laughs> let yourself tolerate that and push through that and ask those questions because you will get an immediate response back from your partner in that. And there's all sorts of ways to generate curiosity about their history, about all these things that you don't really know. And I keep saying this, but like being 
interested in your anxiety. Yes. Right? Like, what is making me so nervous about this? That's crazy. You know, we're just talking about something very simple. And again, it has to be, these observations have to be with love and with care and with honesty, but with a lot of holding. Like I actually was imagining if somebody was listening and they really were anxious, imagining themselves approach in this new way, someone that they want to get to know better or want to be closer to, that with that anxiety that we could just right then bring in a soothing presence or put your hand on your heart or put your hand on your stomach or imagine it so that you can move through it. And that becomes, again, it becomes interesting. It becomes fun. It becomes new. And share your anxiety about it. That's because, right. Because one of the things you're sharing is vulnerability. And what brings relationships closer together is when you can actually experience each other's vulnerability. So if you tend to have lived in the blue and you go and you show vulnerability and like, I don't know why I'm nervous about asking this, or I find myself anxious. It's likely because when you're asking questions, you're showing your need to know, and you're experiencing vulnerability and openness, and that is going to create anxiety. But share that. Like, I don't know why I'm anxious at this dinner. I've decided to ask you a lot of questions, but I'm finding myself nervous. That in and of itself, you can say, I'm curious why. Right. And even that can even be like, uh, are you going to get absorbed by the other person? Are you going to get hurt by them? Or is it exposure? Is it like it could be so many things. And you can just kind of keep digging down so that you can find more and more and more what it might be. Right, right. All right, those are great. So we hope that you basically allowed us to draw you down into your body a little bit more fully and kind of out of your knowledgeable mind into this place of openness and love and connection. As we're closing up, I do want to remind, we are talking a lot about relationships, but also think about the cultivating of openness and connection in other ways into nature, seeing nature anew, seeing as you walk outside, seeing your yard new. I can tell you personally, one of the reasons I love doing this podcast is that it raises my curiosity about and my interest in so many different things and I can feel my whole body stimulated and I just want to invite everybody to keep that aspect open in them. I love that, especially about nature. Again, like just buds and I just think of spring coming and the words that are coming to my mind as we wrap up are like wonder and awe. Yeah, so cultivating wonder and awe. Yes, I love that. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for listening all the way through. And before we close, we would like to do a big request of our listeners. If you find this podcast helpful to you in your life, to those that you love, to your clients, we would really appreciate support and helping us to produce this and keep this going. It's been a labor of love and we so enjoy doing it, but it would be helpful to get support in continuing it. And if you would be so inclined, would you go to www.patreon dot com backslash therapist uncensored and there become a member for as little as five dollars a month for that you will get a deeper dive into some content that we can't put on the podcast you could get access to getting to sue and i as well as requesting topics to be covered and uh, becoming an executive co-producer or go nerd nerd get listed on our website so we would so appreciate your support. And as a matter of fact, we have a new co-executive platinum neuro nerd that'd like to reach out a big thanks to Laura Araby. Thank you so much. We also have a gold neuro nerd who's anonymous, but we appreciate you and you know who you are. And we have also some others that we would like to do a shout out to Kesha Hunt, Valerie Cates, Melanie Roscoe, Luke Adams, Jessica Murphy, and Paige Loria. All of those, we so appreciate your reach out and your support. Thank you so much for your help. And we'll see you around the bend. Therapist Uncensored is Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. This podcast is edited by Jack Anderson. 